Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 116 of the Masterclass. My name is Cam, and I am joined across this wonderful, awesome beer cap laden table uh, by Dave. What's up? Uh, yeah, I'm drinking coffee this morning instead of uh, the sudsy. Well, it, it is before noon. <laughs> It's all relative. It's five o'clock somewhere, right? Well, yes. <laughs> Wherever is, you know, six hours ahead of us. Yeah. So in England. In England, yeah, I think that mm. is about right. They're about seven hours ahead or so. So indeed. Well, I'm drinking ice water. Yes. Delicious Gardner Keynes's. It's actually good water. <sighs> it is. We we do have good water here. So But yeah. Here hey, we are. Yes. Hmm. Here we are. Um I guess we just jump right into it, huh? We can certainly do that. Let's do it. All right, so we're at Romans 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward as a propitiation, that's a big word, by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. All right. So this is obviously uh, right after what we discussed last week. Mm-hmm. where um, we talked about the law and who's under the law and um, how uh, pretty much everyone is going to be, not pretty much, exactly everyone is going to be held accountable by God. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, for It's verse 20 says, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So Paul sets up the fact that all of us, um, by the law, are condemned essentially. None of us can fulfill the law ourselves. The law exists to give us knowledge of our sin. Essentially. It is the, um, the mountain that we can't climb the ladder that we can't, you know, the wall we can't get like whatever analogy you want to use. It is there to stop us in our tracks and make us realize our uh, position in relation to God, which is God of the universe, sinful, unrighteous being, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, so this obviously comes right after it. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, uh, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So Paul immediately follows up the bad news of Jews and Gentiles alike stand condemned before God, but the righteousness of God can be yours, but only through faith in Jesus Christ which is obviously what separates Christians from anybody else. Um, so I think a few things that come to mind here is that when we talk about faith in Jesus, my experience is that we often stop there as in like, yes, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. Yes. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. And that means I get to go be with God in heaven. But what like Paul is saying here is that through our faith in Jesus, we then get the righteousness of God for ourselves, which is bonkers if you think about it. Because like, I don't deserve that. That's a, that's a huge shift in, you know, our existence going from standing condemned before God to standing clothed in his righteousness. Like that's, that's the biggest 180, I think possible in the universe, right? Yes. I'm having many thoughts about this. So do you need more time to contemplate them? Cause I can. No, cause, uh, cause I, cause on the other end, there's kind of this, well, that's kind of offensive. I mean, like, what did I do that's so bad that I deserve hell? Gosh, we do live in a really sad time, don't we? <laughs> okay, but it's supposed to be offensive. 
No, exactly. Because I mean, on, on on face value, there's there's kind of this like you know, if I think about, it, I'm like, well, what have I done that I ha- I have to you know, I haven't killed anybody, I haven't you know, I've tried to be a good person. I mean, really, I haven't done anything that bad. And so, that was just that was kind of one thought that I had. Yeah, and, and I don't truly believe that, but that was kind of that initial like, like I was just I, so I was truly putting myself into so initially i kind of thought about the people who had lived by the law Uh and were thinking well i've done everything i'm supposed to do i've obeyed the law i've you know i've recognized the law i've lived according to the law and so i'm thinking that there's some of those people kind of standing around like going "Uh, what is this guy talking about but then that's probably why they killed him sure exactly (laughs) so so that's so they wound up doing something very bad yeah and then but then I started going, you know, I'm not even, I'm not even Paul. I'm not even somebody that, you know, lived the way I was supposed to be in terms of, you know, he was a Jew of all Jews and he was a Roman citizen. And if anybody had room to boast, it was him. Well, I'm not even in the same category as Paul, but if I were to go, okay, I'm hearing this for the first time. I mean, who's God to tell me that I need his grace? I need forgiveness. And obviously there's, he's God. Yeah. And we've sinned. But I I really think this is kind of where I just think people have a hard time with certain things in our culture, even today being labeled sin. Yeah. It's like, no, that's just the way they are. That's the way they were created. That's, you know, we, we certainly have this idea of right and wrong. And which should be an indicator of something. Right. But it's not. So anyway, so yes, that is a complete 180 when you get to that point of going, because I, I would say as a Christian who's, I feel like the farther along I get in my walk, the more I'm just like, oh my I need your grace. And I think we said that here before of just, I need it more so than I ever thought I did versus when I became an early believer and was probably even in those formative years of Christianity, probably thought I was pretty hot stuff in terms of (laughs) how I was doing my Christian walk. So I don't know if I completely derailed where you were going. No, no. Uh, well, so a couple of things. Um, if, if your response to this is, well, I haven't done that much bad stuff or anything really that bad. It means that you've done some bad stuff. You just don't think it's bad enough to warrant, you know, condemnation from God, if God exists, but it does phrasing it that way admits that you have done some bad things. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other thing I was thinking about, with your, uh, well, two things. I'm going to do them out of order, though, because one of them is more fresh in my brain. Um, Tim Keller has a quote, and I'm paraphrasing it here because I don't remember it word for word, but essentially it's, you know, um, God is more gracious than, you know, you would ever believe, and you are uh, much more of a sinner than you would care to admit. Yeah. Uh, And so I think that as, you know, what you said, as you continue to, grow deeper in your relationship with God and your understanding of him and his word and his kingdom, you begin to see truly the depravity of your situation and your sin, but also the magnitude of his grace more and more. It's like, you know, the tip of the iceberg thing. You're going, you're going further down and realizing, yep, I need more grace and there's always more grace to be had. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's just, it's more of a, you're becoming more aware of the reality of, you know, what it means to be human and you know, what it means for him to be a God who redeems, which, you know. And that's why I think when you look at guys like J.I. Packer and Dallas Willard, and, you know, uh, many of the... Well, even Timothy Keller. Yeah, the guys that have lived it for decades, mm-hmm. and, you, and you hear them talk about this sort of stuff, they get it at a level that I can't even comprehend yet because I just haven't had the experience yet mm-hmm. of living it for 60, 70, 80 years. You yeah. Know? 
So you like look at that and you're like, oh, I want to get there. And it's like, man, that's just time and dedication to knowing God and to admitting your sin and to, you know, being, you know, present and allowing God to show up. Um, and it really is like, you like when we listen to living in Christ's presence with Dallas Willard mm-hmm. and you hear him talk, you're just like, it, it is captivating the way that he talks about God and prayer and his relationship. You're like, man, I suck. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. He's a very, he was a very gifted speaker and writer. Um, so anyways, uh, my next point, well, I actually don't remember what my next point was. It has, uh, flown the coop. So it's all right. Yes. Um, back to the scriptures. I, what I, what I, again, just a little detail, um, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, um, for there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Again, there's the the offensiveness or the audacity of the gospel for, for you know, the creator of the universe to say that we have, you know, sinned and fallen short of his glory. Um, I mean, who's he to say that? Mm-hmm. You're not my mama. <laughs> that was really stupid. Sorry. Um, so there's this. One of the. Uh, opinions I hear people have about Christianity is that, well, Christianity is exclusive. It excludes people. Mm. And I'm like, certain to a certain extent, yes, but to a certain extent, no. Like, Jesus died for everybody because God created everybody. So there's salvation for everybody if you have faith. So the only exclusive part of Christianity is based on your decision to believe or not. So in that sense, yeah, it's exclusive in that you're either a believer or you're not, but that's not somebody else's decision. That's your decision. So it's only exclusive if you choose not to be a part of it. So that's the problem I have with that argument is when people say that Christianity is an exclusive religion. I'm like, well, all religions are exclusive by, by design. You're either believe or you don't, but that's not somebody else's choice for you. That's your decision. Mm-hmm. So when I hear people bring that argument up, I'm just kind of like, well, you're arguing against yourself because you're the one that doesn't believe, but you're using your disbelief as an argument about why my religion's wrong. And I don't understand how that stands <laughs> like at all. It cuts, it's just, it cuts its own legs out underneath it as far as an argument's concerned. Yeah. Um, so I just want to like, it's, he died for everybody. I, I don't see what's wrong with that. Yeah. Well, and that's, I, you know, it's kind of that. And I, I think I'm going to use a bunch of Timothy Keller examples here. Um, one of the ones is coming to my mind to mind is this, this idea of belief and it being exclusive. And it's the whole, you know, I, I can, strap feather wings to my arms and go stand on the roof of my house. And I can believe that I'm going to fly. I can truly genuinely believe I'm going to fly and it's probably not going to happen. I'm guessing that gravity is going to win out and Mm -hmm. I'm going to fall and probably injure myself. I can also get on board a 747 and be absolutely convinced that that plane is going to go down and be completely terrified throughout my entire trip. And then ultimately I make my destination mm-hmm. vast majority of the time. And so that's, I think, you know, for me, it's just kind of that, um, you know, the idea of belief back to what you're talking about with that argument of, you know, just because I believe it, if it's not the truth, then it doesn't matter. And I think that's, you know, central to, to Christianity is, is that, and this is like, you know, the whole, how can you know that it's true? And it's like, well, I guess when we all die, we'll, <laughs> we'll find out that answer because there is an element of, you know. Finality to it. Finality really. to, to, to life. And then the other piece is, is that, um, I, you know, I, I believe that belief 
is not about just believing the right thing. It's my actions need to be consistent with what I believe. Uh, because it's kind of like what you, you know, what we started out on, on that, of people just saying, I believe that, G, you know, I believe Jesus, well, believing the right thing doesn't, that's, again, I think that just falls short. There needs to be evidence that, you know, I'm willing to jump off the roof with feathers taped to my arms or whatever it may be. Yeah, I think Dallas Willard has a quote that goes something along the lines of, he's like talking about being certain. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that have been certain before and have been wrong. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and he might not use the word certain. Yeah, I think it is certain. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, the idea of like, just because, you know, you're certain that you're correct doesn't mean that you are. Um, yeah. Which again, goes to what you're saying. Um, and so, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll find out eventually. Yeah. If this is true or not. Um, yeah, so all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's like, you know, the Romans verse 323. But it's then followed up by, again, so like, it's like John 316 is quoted all the time and everyone knows it, but no one really knows what John 317 is, even though like they're a good pair of verses. Yeah. Same goes here, 24, uh, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So like we focus so much on the negative part. It's like, yeah, we all have fallen, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But guess what? Next verse, really good news. Like, I want to get a billboard that just says, bad news, you're a horrible sinner. Good news, Jesus has got you covered. <laughs> <laughs> just to see what sort of reaction you get. You know, put a phone number or an email up there, see how many angry people. <laughs> just as a social experiment. But that costs a lot of money, so probably not going to happen this time. Um, so, uh, all uh, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So it's not, it is one cohesive thought. It's not two separate ideas. It is one cohesive thought that everyone has fallen short and sinned and are justified by his grace as a gift through them, through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So while it may be offensive and I really don't care. I'm sick of people being offended by dumb stuff. Um, have that offended you? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just trying. <sighs> See, now, anyways, moving on. God is, through Paul, simultaneously saying, you've sinned, you've fallen short of my glory, but I have you covered through Jesus. And again, it is our choice to accept that gift or not. And I'm just going to leave it at that. I think for, for, for this part, I don't really know. I feel like I'm, I'm repeating myself <laughs> and you know, that might be a good strategy to, to beat home an idea, but I think we've done that so far. So he says, uh, that Jesus Christ is who, uh, who God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Do you know what propitiation means, Dave? You said it was a big word when you read it. I don't know if I do know what that means. Uh, as far as I understand, a propitiation is a sacrifice. Mm. So basically they take our place, maybe? Uh, the action of appeasing a God, spirit, oh. or person. Atonement, especially that of Jesus Christ. So... Yeah, it is the so a propitiation by his blood is it is a it is a act of sacrifice that pleases or fulfills whatever debt God is owed. So, because we are all sinners, because we broke the the covenant we had with God by sinning, um and he is a just God, meaning things will be made right in order for things to be made right, there has to be a uh, fulfilling of the debt or uh, a um, reconciliation of the brokenness that has occurred between us and God. And so God decides that the only way for it to truly be made right again is for him to send his son to die in our place 
so that he can be with us again. Which, if you think about it, is one of the most selfless acts ever. Like, we screwed up. Mm-hmm. We're the ones that continue to screw up. We're the ones that build idols and, you know, do everything we can to not be in relationship with him. And he is so hurt by that, but at the same time, desiring of a relationship with us that he's willing to send his son to die so that us dumb humans have a chance of being with him forever, which is just, it's bonkers to think about. Yeah. Well, and just even the, you know, I'm thinking about, okay, a truly like just thinking about God, like a all powerful, like he is the supreme being the, the creator, the maker, you know, if I start thinking about this idea of God doesn't really in a lot of ways make any sense that I would be able to get to know God. Like, yeah. like, like even for like kind of remove like sin out of the picture or even that definition. It's just this idea of, okay, he's God, she's God, that all powerful being I'm created, and yet I think there's some way for me to work at getting to be with God. And it actually makes more sense for him or her, you know, this kind of idea. It makes, this, it, it makes more sense for, for the God to go, you can't come to me on your own. Like, I'm that awesome <laughs> that you need my help to come to me. Really makes sense if, if there is an all-powerful being that put us here on this earth yeah because you would think well i don't know maybe i'm i'm anthropomorphizing a bit too much here that if it was attainable just by working hard and that god did not want his power threatened by someone working hard that there would not be a relationship there that there would be obstacles you know but that's assuming that that god is all good and all loving yeah. So. Yeah, because because even in and you know in the example that we've used many times is, you know my my children. So then if I go to the other extreme and you just take me as my kid's dad, like there's nothing that they can do to earn my love. Mm-hmm. Like I I just love them, and I'm not the awesome god of the universe, and so. I don't know. It so kind of the the in the flip side of my initial statement of being offended by it. You know, as I sit here and think about it, I kind of start going, "Hmm, that actually makes more sense that I would need a way to God that is outside of my control." Well, you said the magic word there, controlled. Mm. All right, so Jesus' sacrifice was to show God's righteousness uh, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the ones who have faith in Jesus. And, all right, well, let's, what does Paul mean when he says justifier of the ones? To have faith in Christ. Because like we see in, in in Romans especially, but in a lot of Paul stuff, like justification, sanctification, and glorification, like the big three ideas that I think deserve some definition. Mm-hmm. Um, because they sound fancy, but they're actually, I think, fairly simple concepts that get dressed up and hidden behind fancy words so <laughs> people with education can rub it in your face. Oh. I'm a, I'm on the I'm on a I'm on a mission, Dave. If I've told you this, I'm on a mission to get people to not be afraid of the Bible, or to not go. I don't read the Bible because I just don't understand it. Like you shouldn't have to go to seminary to have an understanding of Scripture. 
is what I'm trying to say. Yes. And so I think if we can define the big terms and put them in um, like everyday speech, all of a sudden the Bible starts to become a lot less scary and a lot more like, hey, I can read this. I can understand this. I can know God better because anyways, that's, that's my theory. Are you familiar with the Bible project? I'm not. Uh, I hope that's, Ooh, I hope I'm telling that right. So, uh, the Bible project.com is their mission is to show how the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. And they have a series of videos, and I believe they're, I don't know if it's on their website. I know they're, I know you can see them on uh, YouTube. But they do a wonderful job of breaking down um, the Bible in a way that can be understood. And it's an animated, and they kind of talk, and they draw arrows, and they... Oh, cool. And um, so I would I would encourage people to to to, to look at the bibleproject.com. But then I think there's a second piece to that. So I, I'm in agreement with you. I think there's a lot of people in agreement with you on that. But you don't experience that just by watching videos online. And I think that's one of the dangers because I think you still need to be in community. Um I mean, it's one of the things that you and I do when we come to this podcast. It's, it's, we're trying to understand what God has to say to us. Uh-huh. Um, and that's, I think that's how it gets worked out is in community with others. And so um, I felt like I had another point that has escaped me now. <laughs> so <laughs> we're just on fire today with the escaped yeah, uh, right. thoughts. But I, I guess that, yes, I, I, I I don't, I, yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is I don't believe the Bible is as complicated as we want to make it out to be. And well, I think that, I think that people are told that the Bible is complicated because it allows the pastors and the elders to maintain a position of power over the average church member. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is disgusting. Yep. Um, and I think also that people adhere to the Bible as tricky and complicated, and you need to be educated to understand it because that gets them out of having to do the it. responsibility <laughs> of understanding it. Um, so I think it's it's a two edged sword there. Um, but yeah, back to um, the scripture. So the idea of justification. Yep. Is like if you think of like a courtroom setting, right? Mm -hmm. You're being put on trial for your sins, mm -hmm. and God is the judge. And as the judge, He decides what is just and what is not. And so, in this passage, He says He wants to be a just God, but also the justifier of those who have faith. So He is going to, through His sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, He is going to make us justified in the sense that we, in His eyes are deemed um, correct or uh, um, in step with his, you know, kingdom. So being justified means God looks at you and sees someone who is um, righteous, someone who is set apart, someone who is able to enter his kingdom. So the only way that we are justified or we are made right, we are reconciled with him, is through faith in Jesus. So Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection that affords us God's righteousness is what makes us um, just in God's eyes, and allows us to have that relationship with him. So if you ever hear people talking about justification or being justified or that sort of stuff, think of, think of it as what makes you right in the eyes of God. What what makes you reconciled with him so that you can have that relationship? That's what it means. Yes. I would agree with you. Well, so, when 
uh, when he says, um, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just in the justifier of the ones who have faith in Jesus. So his, his, uh, sending, sending Jesus to die, uh, allowing his righteousness to pass through that to those who believe, um, was so that he could justify or make right all of the people that have faith. So I think, I don't know. I'm sick of church bashing. Um, <laughs> I do it cause I care, Dave. I do it because I care. Um, there are people that I have sat under in churches, be it as a, as a you know, a kid, a teenager or an adult that, stop at Jesus in their Mm -hmm. teaching. And I get why Jesus is an incredibly captivating, amazing, truly unique person. Mm -hmm. What he did is unprecedented. Uh, The way that he spoke and interacted, the fact that he was man and God at this, like it, like I get it, but I think we do. God as a whole, the Trinity, you know, the creator of the universe, the, you know, the father, the son and the Holy spirit and what his goals are. I think we do a disservice if we stop at Jesus and don't realize what Jesus was really here for, which was to bring the righteousness of God to all people, to usher in the kingdom of God, to give us the Holy spirit as a helper. Once he went back up, to heaven Mm -hmm. until he returns again. Like there's so much about our faith that happens after Jesus in the sense of what he accomplished and then what has to get worked out after that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't remember being taught a single thing about the Holy spirit really (laughs) other than he was part of the Trinity and he was the little voice in our head that told us we were doing things wrong. And I grew up in a Baptist turned non-denominational, but still Baptist really church, (laughs) you know? So that's not terribly surprising, uh, unfortunately. But I just think this passage kind of spells it out. Like, yeah, Jesus came on a mission and I'm not, I'm not at all trying to undermine what Jesus did or lessen the value or like anything about that. I'm just trying to say, I think there's more to Christian faith than focusing a hundred percent on Jesus. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a lot that has to do with, with God, the father and with the Holy spirit. And I, and I, I don't know. Am I making any sense? Uh, oh yeah, definitely. Definitely making sense. Um, and you know, I don't know if what I'm about to say is completely accurate, but I'm, I'm having this sense of, you know, we like Jesus and we focus on Jesus because that's kind of like our piece in all of this. It's like, that's what justifies me to God. That's what makes me right for God. That's what allows me to get into heaven is Jesus. I mean, that's, so that's really kind of what we kind of latch onto that. This is what's going to get me into heaven. And then I think there's like this other part of, you know, God, the father, um, this idea of like, he truly deserves worship like he truly um you know Moses got to experience God and basically you know God had Moses look away and um got to see kind of God's reflection uh because God was so awesome and then you know even in that Moses' face shone and it just was like um you know so so yeah, so it's like we latch onto the Jesus because there's this. It makes me feel good. It gets into heaven, but we miss out on kind of the uh, transcendence, the worship of God, the fact that He is worthy, and how awesome He is. And then I even think was kind of thinking that the Holy Spirit is the the prompting of how we serve others and how we live out our faith uh, day in and day out. I mean, He's He's the counselor. He was the one that came to help not just tell us when we did something wrong, but I think lead us and guide us and. I think that's kind of where we miss out on how do we serve others and how do we share the gospel and how do we be salt and light is we, well, we have to do it with dependence on the Holy spirit. And, um, again, I don't know if what I'm saying is right or accurate, but it just had this sense of like, 
yeah, we latch onto Jesus because he's the one that gets us into heaven. And then we kind of, eh, forget about the other elements of worshiping the creator of the universe and then also being obedient to what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do. Yeah. I, I So here's my uh, challenge. That's such a churchy Christianese thing to say. I challenge you this week. Um, when you're at church, and while this Sunday might not be fair because it's Easter, so it's going to be all about the resurrection. So it's mm-hmm. going to be all about Jesus. Um, but like on a normal Sunday, listen to the lyrics of the songs that you guys are singing. And how much of it is about you? How much of it is about Jesus? <laughs> and how much of it doesn't regard God the Father or the Holy Spirit at all? Just as a little exercise. Yeah. And because what amazes me is how many songs we sing in church that are actually about us. Oh, I, it, even compared to like what was written 100, 150 years ago in terms of that is, it's all about what you do for me and you do this for me. And it's all singular too. It's not even communal. It's, it's not singular. us. It's me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is very true. Well, and I even just think about, and this is one of the things I remember having a conversation with Ty Cross about was just how we are so casual in the way we go into worship. You know, we're still kind of talking. We're still kind of consumed with things. And I get that's part of it. But one of the ones that has really started to irk me is the number of people that are on their phones when worship is going on. And I I know I'm guilty of it and, uh, you know, easier said than done. But uh, I really do think worship needs to be held in higher regard by all of us because it's not just about the music and singing the songs. It goes back to your point of we should really be worshiping God and not so focused on ourselves and how it makes us feel or. Or that we're feel, or that even that we're feeling an obligation by <laughs> singing them. Mm. So interesting passage, yes. interesting couple verses. I mean, we shouldn't end this one on a downer. Like, guys, we have the righteousness of God. That's awesome. I mean, I don't know what else you could really ask for. <laughs> I'd rather have a BMW, thanks. I wouldn't want to pay the uh, car insurance <laughs> for one of those. But yeah, I mean, crazy in a good way. Makes me makes me want to not be such a complainer. Yeah, it, it makes me go, how do I ever get focused on anything else? <laughs> like, why do I get so consumed by the other things when this is really, wow. And I should be excited to tell other people about it. Absolutely. I should I should care more than I do, mm-hmm. but I don't. Well, that's I think a conversation for another day. Another day, <laughs> but yes, I agree with you. Um, all right. Well, thanks so much for listening. And uh, show notes will be in the podcast app that you are currently listening in, unless you're at our website. They'll be right there, right there. Uh, so if you're at the website, you already know how to get there. But if you're listening on uh, your phone and you want to go to the website supermegacorp.net slash masterclass and this episode was going to be slash 116 and uh, links for Twitter and email are in the show notes and a link to our Patreon is there and a big thank you to our Patreon supporters for uh, liking us so much they throw us some money every month (laughs) that's again talk about another crazy thing super cool we really appreciate it and uh, until next time uh, I guess be good see ya bye bye